Um, so we have some kind of resource that emits some kind of radiation. I won't bore you with the details unless you really want to know. We'd be happy to talk about it for hours. Um, we have some kind of detector. We won't go into the details. I'll be happy to talk about those for hours. Um, it detects the interaction, produces some kind of electrical signal that then gets sent to some kind of hardware that then collects that hardware or collects that signal. We have software that then reads it out. We send that those data either to disk or to some kind of shared memory buffer. We have some analysis software that either picks it up live from the shared memory buffer, and you'll see why I'm using air quotes later, um, or reads it from disk and then does some kind of visualization. I hope all of you catch my drift by this point. We'll get into it a little bit more as well, just to drive it home more. So what's the pros and cons of this kind of thing? And by the way, I didn't mention this before, but I like interactive talks. So if anybody's got questions, we've got plenty of time. I'm probably going to be a little bit under time. I've scheduled for 40 minutes, but I'm never on time. Always under, don't worry. Um, and so if you have any questions about any of the material, just ask, right? If I say I'm not going to go into details and you want, just say so. We'll do it. Um, so the pros and cons of this kind of approach um, are, I think, are fairly simple. And I've already told you guys some of them, right? It takes a long time to do it, right? We don't do things in batch. When I want to reread my data, I reread it from this, and I unpack those binary data every single time. It's terrible. Um, this is the kicker here for me, um, because oftentimes what you're doing is you're trying to correlate things within a certain amount of time, right? And sometimes those events are coming from many different data sources. I've got data coming from the cycle account. I've got data coming from my detectors. I've got data coming from just my hard disks, right? My, my main data acquisition machine telling me what am I doing, how am I doing, and is my disk about to fill up because you didn't provision enough space for me, that kind of stuff. And so the, the cons really outweigh the pros of this kind of approach in today's day and age. As I mentioned, this worked amazing for decades, right? But as experiments started to scale, these types of data analytics you know, serial data analytics pipelines just started to break down. Um, I'll never forget, I was out at uh, Livermore National Lab and we were taking a tour and I was talking to somebody and they were working on this fission chamber where they, they had uranium in the center of the fission chamber and they were measuring the fission products from the uranium. And uh, we were talking to them about their detector and I said, well, how many signals do you guys get from this thing? Oh, about a thousand. Wow, how much data do you generate from this? And they go, oh, uh, about a petabyte a minute, right? They actually ended up having to come up with new protocols, network protocols, just to handle the data rate from this one detector, right? None of my experiments were that heavy, but it gives you kind of idea of the kind of things that we're looking at in these types of fields. And don't even get me started on the LHC because those guys take an incredible amount of data. So, Speaking of the acquisition, what I want to do is kind of give you guys a little bit of idea of where do things sit. I will be honest, it's biased from my perspective. I'll talk mostly about acquisition systems that I've either worked on, built, or um, had exposure to. But these are the norms, kind of the industry, industry average in the nuclear physics community. So the first one we'll talk a little bit about um, was developed at Oak Ridge uh, UTK. This is this was the first one that I worked on um, as a student. Um, the, the key thing here to point out about, about this data acquisition system is that it's shared memory or it's message passing that it does in order to broadcast its data uses the UD, uh, UDP, which if any of you are familiar with UDP, it is kind of a, uh, here's some stuff, I hope it got there, I don't really care, I hope it got there, maybe. Actually, no, I don't really care. <laughs> and so what you end up with is a loss of data here, right? You have data fidelity issues where you potentially lose stuff over the network. Our data acquisition systems were actually talking uh, to the, uh, uh, the writing software through the loop back on the device. It wasn't even sending it over the network, and it still didn't have good fidelity. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, the types of things that you don't want to get into, right? Um, Another big thing to call out, it's, it's limited to consuming from a single data source. You can produce into basically two data sinks at a time, your shared memory or your binary data from disk. Um, and this is, these are the electronics I was mentioning before the, uh, uh, that I worked on. These are the boards that I helped um, 
XA um, characterized and developed for their signal processing. So the other um, data acquisition system I worked with was at uh, the NSCL slash FRIB. I think it's technically EFRIB now, um, officially. So EFRIB is the um, largest nuclear physics research laboratory in the United States now, or accelerator lab more specifically. Um, we've sent billions of dollars into it. It's a very, very nice facility. They have an advantage over UT in the sense that they actually have a full-time staff of physicists that develop their software. Um, and their software is a little bit more modern in the sense of it uses crazy things like unit tests and continuous integration. Um, whereas uh, that is that particular aspect of their data acquisition or their kind of analysis software package is um, outside of the norm, which should scare anyone in this room. And I just found one problem with your experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had the same problem. Um, so, one of the common things you'll see is physicists like to take their data home with them. And so, uh, they often write them into binary files. Binary files are packed well, you know this. Um, but unfortunately, what that means is if you need to decode that later or reanalyze your data, you're now having to unpack that EBT file, right? Or decode or deserialize that every single time you want to look into it. That's not very efficient. Um, the, uh, the kind of shared memory framework that they have, um, they call, or they're called ring buffers. Um, this is a very common programming paradigm, I'm sure most of you are programmers. Um, so the basic idea behind a ring buffer is that I start writing at the beginning, I continue writing into this fixed memory segment once I hit the end, I just start over at the beginning. Now what's funny about this is you can see from this diagram here. So let's say I have one data source, I have two data source, Right, we go through the ring buffer here. We, this guy writes data here. The ring buffer writes data out to its filter. The filter writes into another ring, ring buffer, and then they merge together here. And the same you know, path here without a filter. Now, here comes the interactive part of this. Can somebody tell me what happens to, let's say, you know, this merger code, for example, if this ring buffer this source is writing into this ring buffer too quick, and I'm not consuming it before I get to the end. Yeah, that's probably what you think, right? You get contention, right? This guy will start to fill up, right? Because this guy's got a lock on a memory segment, and this guy doesn't know how to move past that memory segment because ring buffers are forced sequential writes. And so this guy will back up, and so your data acquisition backs up, and so your hardware FIFO backs up, and so everything comes screeching to a halt and crashes and dies and burns and people are mad because your experiment died and you just wasted a million dollars. This happens a lot, right? I ran, uh, it, I just ran a tabletop experiment and managed to break this. Um, and it comes down to the fact that you have, you have two failure modes here, right? You have your analysis software, right? Or your merging software and you have your data sources. If this guy's too fast and this guy's too slow, you're screwed. If this guy's too fast and you don't handle his memory management property, you'll also end up screwed because how does he know when this guy has written something here that he needs to know about? There's no communication between these two other than a memory segment here. So what does that mean overall? It means we should look at the analysis. Let's try to speed up the, the downstream side. So for the analysis, uh, and I've, I've grouped together, we all know how this works, right? You've got basically three major concepts. You've got data acquisition, you've got data analysis, and you've got data visualization, right? We all know what these things are by this point. Um, so I've grouped the analysis and visualization together um, simply for kind of ease, because in physics, they go hand in hand. If I need to change this plot, or I need to do, make a new gate on this plot, I go through this entire process from binary data, unpacking, build my bits, pre-process, process, build my graph. Oh man, that's wrong. Let's go back to here. Not, not something you want to really deal with. This is still heavily relying on um, a piece of software called DAM. Uh, it's built in Fortran, it's built in the 80s. Um, the gentleman that uh, developed it died in the 90s and it just kind of hobbles along and 
you kind of hope it compiles at this point in time on Ubuntu 19.04. Um, so this is what I cut my teeth on was this software. So I do want to spend a little bit more time on it to give you guys kind of an idea of what the traditional nuclear physics workflow looks like from a data analysis standpoint. So you start in the upper left, you start up your UI, you know, your, your kind of uh, interface with your users. What do you want to do? I want to analyze this file. How do you want to do it uh, fast? Um, we process command line arguments. There's an XML config that goes along with it. It unpacks the data. It then um, validates your unpacked data. It builds events. So um, one thing I didn't mention is that the experiments that I traditionally work with use what's called digital electronics. And um, I'll get into the details of those later, but digital electronics, um, they don't have a, um, what, what we would call an event. Or an event is anything that is time correlated that makes sense to us. Um, so you have to build those events up out of your data. Uh, you have to do any analysis of your digital signal processing, that kind of stuff. You need to do calibrations, you need to pre-process, um, you know, validation, cleansing, the, the munching aspect. You need to process those data and then fill your visualization. So all of these steps from the orange down here to the brown all happen serially, and then you look right back up to the orange and start all over again. Not a very hot way to do this. And I will continue to harp on the fact that this is stupid. Uh, so uh, when I left UT, I started my own uh, company uh, that does uh, uh, data, uh, basically detector development, design, assistance, consulting work, basically, you know, data analysis, data visualization, that kind of stuff. Um, so as part of that work, I got hooked up with um, a group in South Africa, and I continued to develop, to develop the code from UT. Just, it was all, you know, GPL kind of stuff. I just forked and said, okay, let's keep going try to make it better. Um, so I made it better by adding a little bit more parallelization into the process, but really at the end of the day, I was just unhappy with the framework, right? It's, when I worked, when you've worked on it as long as I had, which was close to eight years, right? You get to feel it's like, oh, it's my baby, right? It's my precious, I don't want to throw it away. But I really didn't at the time know a better way to do it, which we, I do now, and we'll talk about that. So um, what I've taken advantage of here is parallel processing. Um, I use something called root for visualization. I will talk more about that um, because it is an incredibly nice uh, visualization package. I mean, you can make some beautiful plots with it, plots with it, but it has some incredibly glaring problems um, that will be obvious to anybody who knows anything about databases here soon. Um, and the biggest thing that I added to this code was CI and test, right? How do we know whether or not this histogram is correct unless I can trust my algorithms that are producing it? Um, so basically what I did here is that I just added the parallelization at the end where we create and fill the visual histogram or the, we do the visualization um, in a, a separate thread um, or a separate, separate trunk from the rest of the process. And the rest is still the same. Uh, simply because of the problems that I mentioned before. We had 12 years of people all hacking this together in all kinds of different ways. This code started in Fortran 90, moved to C, then moved to C++, and then finally landed in my lab. So um, there was just too much infrastructure in place just to try to fix it at the end of the day. So at the NSC on EFRIB, they produced these gems of plots. So that, if you can't tell, is a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution um, of some baby decay raw thing. Uh, this is written in my favorite piece of software, Tickle. I'm totally joking. Um, so it's written in Tickle. You can expand it with C++ code. The problem here is Tickle is so slow. And this is why your ring buffer dies. Right? Because if you try to plot five of these and do some actual logic with them, your ring buffer is not going to be cleared fast enough for you to write it to. Uh, their biggest problem that they have uh, is serial processing. I was, uh, a buddy of mine works up there, I was talking to him, um, reading through some of his presentations. They're talking about parallelizing this. Um, I didn't show those pictures because um, it's actually kind of unfortunate. 
uh, simply because of the fact that um, they are talking about building a lot of the kind of uh, messaging from scratch. And I'll show you what I believe to be a better way to do it um, down the line. Um, so I did promise to talk a little bit about Root. Um, you can see here on the left one of their publication quality plots. Um, it is a little bit busy. The information is packed densely, but it is a very nice plot. It's, I think it's beautiful um, in terms of the overall capabilities that this software package has and being able to express it very clearly. Um, one of the interesting things about Root is that um, their software is huge. It's 50 million lines of code. I've compiled it on this laptop and it takes about five hours with all of my threads moving as quick as possibly can. Um, the shortest amount of time I've managed to get this to compile is about um, a minute and a half, and that was on 56 words. <laughs> So that gives you kind of an idea of what you're dealing with here. What's interesting, I think, about this though, is they've got 50 million lines of code, and eventually the SQL Plus Standards Committee said, wow, you guys have really done a lot here. Why don't we get some of you to give some feedback to us so that we can help make SQL Plus a little bit better? Um, which, which I think is a really cool um, thing about Root. Now, what I do not think is cool about Root is this. They're called trees, and they're called trees because of the structure. So you have your tree here, that tree has branches, your branches have leaves, and your leaves basically just represent a single um, type of data. So let's say it's a, a channel, um, you know, it's a, a customer name, it's a customer zip code, that kind of stuff. Um, and so you can see here uh, a little bit better diagram of that, right? So you've got your branches in your tree, you've got your leaves, your leaves have um, typically uh, standard data types, int, string, double, float, whatever. Um, a group or collection of trees is called a chain, which I think they really missed out on a marketing play there. It's called a forest, right? You're right in the damn thing. Um, and so you can see um, the, the problem that we're going to run into, right, is you have a tree, and that tree has two friends, and those friends have leaves. And let's say I want to correlate um, something with on my M leaf with something on my B leaf. Well, turns out what they've implemented is a row-oriented database with a NoSQL framework, all custom. And so if I want to do a essentially a join between this table and that table on one of the rows, I have to serially move through the entire now let's stop and think about it for a second. Let's sink in. Don't go running for the door. I've got solutions for this, right? But this is traditionally how it works, right? And really, what people use Root for is the very end of the analysis, the very last thing in their pipeline. After they've done their sanitization, after they've done their validation, after they've done all of the heavy lifting, that's where they get into Root. Um, and in which case, if I want to plot this variable as a his 1D histogram, it's okay because I only have to iterate through a million of them, not 600 million of them. So that is my brief gripe about root. Oh, the, the other fun part about root trees, you can't write them in parallel. Let that sink in too. Um, so if you want to write all three of these from a single uh, analysis package, you actually have to open um, Nothing, right? You have to have three different consumers because uh, the way root is built, if you open one, it takes precedence, all you get um, because they all share a memory space. Um, so, yeah, you chuckle, but that was my life for 12 years. So, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, I, I think I've hopefully given you guys enough of a kind of general overview of where we're at in nuclear physics as it stands. Well, not too much before I start a new project. Um, so let's look at some actual analysis techniques because I think everybody likes those. Um, so this is boiled down, this is what my thesis was in, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, you have some kind of start signal, you have some kind of stop signal, there is a delay, we want to measure the delay and make some meaningful judgments about them. 
Those signals all go into your data acquisition hardware. You do some analysis on them, you do some visualization, Bob's your uncle, and um, people have to start calling you doctor, and you can get to the front of the line at um, various restaurants. So um, the, the relationships between the signals look like this. Um, we have the first signal, we have the second signal. We'll denote these time of arrival by phi one and phi two. There is some delta between the two of them. It should surprise nobody that this is a linear relationship. Any data processing that you do to these signals must maintain this relationship. Should it fail, you have failed. Um, I, what I plot here is the sampling frequency. Since we're dealing with digital systems, you're sampling your signals. It's not an analog system, you are sampling it. Um, and your sampling comes at specific intervals. And you'll see why that, um, where that comes into play in just a moment. So this is a close-up of the board, and this is uh, one of my favorite slides to talk through. Like I said, I can talk about this stuff for hours. So you start here on the left, and so basically these lines here all correlate with the images that you will see. I'm gonna catch that guy. <laughs> um, so you have your input signal coming on the left. It goes through an analog filtering stage here. Um, typically a low-pass filter it removes any of the high-frequency transients from your signal. You have your ADC here that um, then samples your signal. That signal goes to the FPGA right here. That FPGA does your digital signal processing parts of it. So this one in particular has trapezoidal filters um, to give you both the time of arrival and an energy. That DSP then sends its data along with the trace, should you choose, to the uh, uh, DSP, uh, the digital signal processor. So that's the FPGA, that's the DSP. So the DSP does some additional high level like floating point calculations if necessary, um, aggregates the data from the entire board and then sends it off the back channel. Um, and there's a, there's a crate that's got a back point to it. So what you see is a nice uh, uh, break at the ADC between your analog chain and your digital chain here. You can see how much different it is in terms of just the density of stuff that you need in order to process your signal. This is all basically from a data analytics standpoint, this is your data you clean up here. This is your uh, kind of sampling here, your accurate uh, analysis here, and then this is what's going to give you your messages. So if we look at that down at the bottom um, from left to right again, you have your input signal. You have that signal after it's passed through the low pass filter. What you see that it does is basically um, for this type of signal, it just shortens it, makes it a little bit more spread out. Uh, the ADC then samples. It, uh, the ADCs that I'll be talking about um, are 250 mega samples per second, which translates to um, four nanoseconds per sample. So each one of these bins represents four nanoseconds in time. And that's 10 to the minus nine. Um, I sometimes forget these numbers these days. Uh, so then you apply your trapezoidal filtering, uh, which actually looks like this um, after you do it. Um, and then there's various ways to do this. Oftentimes you take kind of the last point here before the downturn as your energy. And then the arrival time is um, somewhere right in here-ish, something like that. So what does the, the digital signal actually look like? So it looks like this. Um, you have some kind of threshold. This is your trigger threshold um, here. Uh, your timestamp for your trapezoidal filter sits right there. Your phase, the one that we talked about earlier, sits right here. Um, and I had to do a lot to, to kind of define the nomenclature of these um, signals because it seemed like there wasn't any standard in the community for that. So it was um, a lot of fun trying to come up with the different names. Um, now, the, this, is, this is a question that I think is interesting, is what is the timing resolution of such a system, right? I mentioned we have, we go back a page, right? Each one of these samples represents four nanoseconds, right? So what do we assume then that my resolution here is going to be? What's the best? How close, or what's the minimum time difference I can measure between this guy and another signal? This is a giving question. Kind of shy, I guess. I'll answer, four nanoseconds. Right? That's the smallest diff time difference that one could resolve in a system like this. That's a total lie, but um, that's naively what you would get if you do not do additional processing. 
Um, so one of the techniques that you can use to do your additional processing is called a constant fraction discriminator. Now what a constant fraction discriminator does, and I have the equation there, you may or may not be able to get, um, but I figured since we were kind of a pi data group, I should put some Python in here somewhere. Um, so what this does is um, if we've got our original signal from the previous slide here, and the CFD will take that signal, it shifts it, inverts it, and subtracts it. So what you end up with is a bipolar signal denoted by this dashed line here. And now the advantage of doing this, um, well, actually, it, it shifts it, scales it, inverts it, and then subtracts it. And the advantage of this is that what you end up with is this bipolar signal that is now insensitive to um, the uh, leading edge here, right? So that's why it's a constant fraction discriminator. So it's going to give you, if you have a amplitude, uh, the same amplitude signal come in, it will always trigger at the same place. Right? Your pi will always be the same. Now the advantage, or well, disadvantage of this, is that this interpolation here, you are assuming that your um, the leading edge of your signal is linear in nature. And so what you will end up seeing is that because you assume that this leading edge of this Gaussian looking signal is linear, that this will in turn give you nonlinear results. And it has to do with basically the derivative of this guy. And so because you potentially have nonlinear results here, um, this type of timing in this situation only works in very specific scenarios. And those scenarios are, as you can imagine, integral multiples of the sampling frequency. If your delay is 0, 4, 8, 16, 32 nanoseconds, this will work every time. As soon as you deviate from that, in fact, half integer multiples or half multiples are the worst. So two, four, or two nanoseconds is one of the worst, right? And then it loops well to six. Um, so you can't use this in this type of system to do timing. And the goal here is to get better than four nanoseconds, right? So what I came up with is, as a very young and naive and dumb student, let me just fit it. Seems easy enough. There's the equation we came up with, not as easy enough. <laughs> um, there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, and uh, as a student, I had to calculate the Jacobians of that by hand, um, which was not fun. So, um, but this is what the fit looks like. Um, you can see here, I've got error bars drawn on this guy as well now. Um, to kind of give you an idea of how well that fit actually does. The two most important things for the fit actually are the amplitude and its position in time. We fix the shape, we assume, we assume that the shape is consistent across all amplitudes and across all types of detectors. So for example, if I have a plastic center with a certain brand of PMT on it, that will always produce the same shaped signal, we assume. And we'll see, I'll mention later ways that we can improve this with modern techniques. So here's the results of the algorithm um, and the, the, the role that the sampling frequency plays in your ability to, to do this um, sub-sampling uh, timing resolution. So the best I was able to do with the 250 megahertz system is 51 picoseconds. Time is how small I can measure. And I could probably go smaller if the jitter in my signal was not 51 picoseconds. So I'm really hitting the limits of what my signal generator or what my detector could produce at that time. Um, I wasn't necessarily blocked by hardware limitations here. Um, and part of the reason for this, um, these results are the fact that this very well takes into account baselines um, and the uh, uniformity of these signals or the behavior of the signals is actually fairly consistent. Um, but it does cause some issues later on when you get more variation in those signals. Um, and so, you know, we go from 51 picoseconds at a, a one volt signal. This is a 20 millivolt signal, and we're still under half a nanosecond in terms of time resolution. So, um, you know, we were wanting to measure things on the order of um, a nanosecond. So this was, you know, fantastic in terms of the, uh, the results. Now, the question that you guys, I'm sure, have is, how do we know it's right? 
you know, they're great. He showed me this, and you've got some nice lines, you've got some nice data points, and they seem to follow some kind of rule or some kind of you know rule. But how do we know that it actually worked? Um, here's how: basically, we check and we make sure we got the linear relationship right. If I plot phase one versus phase two, is it a straight line? <laughs> no harder than that. Um, so what you see for the fit is you do indeed have straight lines for the fit. Um, this is at two nanoseconds here. Um, it, it is really nice. The, the reason that you have two lines is, um, if you've been paying attention, uh, is due to the sampling frequency. This, these signals were all in the same time box. These signals were one time box apart. So one fell in the first, the other fell in the second. Um, and the, the time difference between this group and this group is exactly four nanoseconds. Um, you expect these things to be uniformly dist distributed. This was a uh, kind of idealized situation, but you expect to be uniformly distributed here. Um, and I have a, a very small, embarrassing size, um, the CFD's performance at the same time delay. Um, you can see it makes kind of a fun wavy plot, um, but it definitely does not um, approach the linear relationship that we would expect um, from such a system. If you're interested, there's the link to my paper that I've published on this. Have fun. It is very boring. Now, I think that you should all agree with me at this point that basically do the same thing that everybody else does in <laughs> data analytics or data science, right? It's exactly the same work. We've got data. We need to collect it somehow. We need to analyze it somehow. We need to visualize it somehow. We need to make some kind of business decision from it. So, I got on the left. What do we do in physics typically for these experiments? I've got on the right what the industry typically does. And I should have just copy pasted, to be honest. Um, there's nothing here that should surprise anybody. Um, some of the, the data um, formats are different. We don't typically use CSVs, we're typically using root trees, um, uh, some other kinds of binary data, things like that. Um, we don't typically use CSVs, uh, databases other than the root trees, um, if you call it a database. Um, but really, at the end of the day, the, the most important things are we all need high fidelity storage, right? You can't have your you know, thesis experiment just going missing <laughs> because you don't get another shot at that. Um, and same holds true for the industry side, right? If I miss the customer interaction, that's one less data uh, I know about my customer. And now I may or may not be able to make an informed decision on how to help support or engage that customer. Um, obviously, you need it real time. JTV is a perfect example of this. We have a live broadcast that we are um, working on analysis techniques to analyze the live broadcast. The facial recognition on our show host. How much time is the show host spending on air? Um, things like that. So it's real time. You need high fidelity and you need to do it fast. We've got the same thing in physics. Right, we've got an um, accelerator operator sitting there tweaking knobs. He needs to know very quickly what has happened to that beam. Where's my beam? And that is a question that you get asked all the time by the operators. Is, where, where'd the beam go? I don't know. I will see if it's in my detectors. If not, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Um, so I won't belabor this point. The parallels are obvious. Um, now the question I think then becomes, how do we start to fix our process in nuclear physics? I've enumerated kind of what I call the big problems that we need to solve. They follow roughly the same um, kind of breakdowns that we've discussed already. Um, we need extensible and scalable. You saw that we, we run the gambit between petabytes of data. I know I've run experiments that have one detector that saw one count, you know, every minute. So we run a gambit, right? It has to scale well from very low rate to very high rate, very well. Um, and it must incorporate multiple systems, right? We've got our DAC machine. We've got statistics from the um, accelerators. We've got stuff coming in from other experiments, potentially. Um, and so we need to be able to correlate those across time. Um, we need something better than binary data formats. Of course, they pack well, but you can't analyze them, not in any meaningful ways, without deserializing it. And that is an expensive process, um, or can be, especially when you're trying to do it live. 
Um, we have to be able to do multiple processes at the same time. That's a key, right? We need to be able to unpack those data or visualize those data or do some kind of munching of those data in order to be able to achieve the goals in a reasonable amount of time. It can't take 56 hours for me to tell you what happened on you know, your broadcast two minutes ago because those types of data, you need a short feedback loop. And then how can we translate what I put big data in quotes because it's kind of a in flux. 10 years ago, big data was a terabyte. Now it's you know, 500 terabytes. So, um, But I think it would be nice to have some kind of model that lets us transition into that world very easily um, you know, with a low, low bar. And again, we have three main components, DAC analysis and visualization. So here's my team. We've got Kafka, which you guys may or may not know about, so I will talk more about Kafka. We have Python, which I will say almost nothing about. Um, and then we have Plotly and, and Kibana. Uh, Plotly, I probably won't talk too much about Kibana. Um, I'll say a few words about it. I don't have much to say on it. Um, so Kafka, for those of you who are familiar with the framework, is a uh, messaging interface, a streaming messaging interface, um, it's uh, redundant, scalable. Um, it's one of uh, Apache's, you know, products. Uh, uses Zookeeper and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the uh, advantages of this is, and the reason that I absolutely adore it for the applications that I have, it is a, a multi-consumer or multi-producer, multi-consumer uh, application. So you can have n number of data sets, x number of um, data uh, consumers and you're still okay. Uh, the, the message throughput is, uh, I, I think, pretty great in terms of what all the experiments that we work on. It's a million messages per second um, input, two million messages per second output, which is great if you need multiple consumers. Um, the key here, and one of the things that you've noticed if you've looked or if you know anything about these guys here, it's an open source stack. It's a source stack that has an incredible, incredible community behind it, especially the guy in the middle. Um, Kafka's got an incredible community behind it as well. I know Plotly does simply because of this guy. Um, and Kibana, I at least think, does as well. Um, but Kibana is a little bit hit or miss. It is starting to get mainstream, but there are some competitors out there with it. So. Um, so you can see the, very quickly the advantages of, model, of a model like this. So how does that fit into our, our physics kind of framework? So we've got producers, and what I'm going to slowly reveal to you here is kind of a, a, a typical physics experiment and um, hopefully rainbow uh, colors. Um, so we have here uh, detector group one, detector group two. They each have their own data acquisition systems, the hardware itself. They both have producers that are producing into our Kafka topics. Um, then we have another little standalone guy here, which is our high voltage system, which is important um, to, uh, to measure detector drift. You know, it, this guy will be powering these detectors. If the voltage here changes, we need to know that uh, because that affects our signal for our DSP. Um, and so what we can do is we send all these different things into Kafka topics, and I should have added a slide specifically about that. So Kafka is broken up into topics and um, partitions. Um, that meshes forward, basically. Um, you know, but it, it's a subreddit, <laughs> um, for lack of a better word. So um, these guys will all produce into their own topics. And what you can do is you can then aggregate those data across those topics. And the key here is that you need to ensure that you have consistent timestamps amongst all of your producers, right? All of these data need to have the same timestamp because otherwise you can't correlate them together later. Um, there's a protocol out of CERN, it's called White Rabbit. Uh, it is a network time protocol um, that you can set up on your network. Um, the times are accurate down to the nanosecond with almost zero jam. So it's an incredibly powerful protocol to inject into 
something like this, your uh, Kafka topics can accept an arbitrary timestamp, which means that you can use the White Rabbit protocol to timestamp your Kafka messages, giving you nanosecond precision on these messages themselves. On the other side of our Kafka, um, we have the uh, consumers. And now uh, you don't need to have all of this on one location. Kafka is a um, distributed framework. So you could potentially, uh, by the way, AWS has a version of Kafka, it's called Kinesis. Um, it's a funny story, look it up, I won't get into it, or you can ask me about it later. Um, and so you, we have our data, um, our data coming into the topics here. I have color matched the um, arrows coming out. Um, and so what you can see is we can have various things that happen. We can have an online analysis that's producing our histograms. We have our rate and voltage monitor that's on a Kibana dashboard to make sure that our detectors are counting, right? I can't tell you the number of times I've come into my shift and I've found a student sitting there. And how are things going? Great. These histograms have been wonderful. Why do my count rate zero? Oh, uh, I was just running this command. You, so you've been scanning the same data for the past eight hours. I, I guess, I guess. We're gonna have someone with you next time, buddy. Um, you, have some, you have a consumer that can um, put stuff into your data sync. This is another place where we can gain uh, over the uh, kind of traditional binary frameworks. Um, we're looking at uh, Parquet files, Avro files, Postgres, you know, some of these kind of more modern database frameworks. Um, I really like them or dig in the idea of Parquet files because traditionally uh, the data that we get um, out of the uh, hardware that I was discussing, um, it is basically comes out as a table. So parquet files are great for this. Um, and then we can very trivially pick those up with Spark later on to do the actual even force power uh, analysis parts. Um, we have beam control, this is what I was mentioning earlier. You know, hey, where's my beam? Uh, turn it left, turn it right, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, now what's cool, I think, about this, and this can also go into your visualization parts with uh, Kibana. Uh, Kibana is just a visualization framework. It's part of the ELK stack. Um, I think I got a slide on this later, but it's part of the ELK stack. Um, so it's Elasticsearch log stash at Kibana. Um, it basically does log aggregation, things like that, which is really useful um, for these types of experiments because sometimes you do need to be aware of, you know, how much memory does my DAC machine use it right now? How much um, hard disk space does it have? You know, what's the overall load? Is that affecting my data fidelity? Things like that. So having this um, kind of um, pre-built um, log viewing, it, it can do dashboarding and all kinds of really fancy stuff. It's a nice, uh, nice application. So being able to do that live very easily, and you can teach a student how to do it in five minutes is um, you know, key for these types of things. As I mentioned, keeping it simple for the students can be a boon sometimes. Um, and so here's the full picture. So we have the, the producers on the left, multi-producer, multi-consumer model. Um, what is really cool about this to me is the fact that we can have feedback loops where the analysis or the voltage monitor or the, the rate monitor uh, consumer can be crunching those numbers, processing those data. Hey, we've been noticing a drift in your data. That can throw a flag here. It can throw a flag back in here. So maybe we can start doing some logic on the producer side to start telling the DAC to do something different if necessary. Hey, you've just lost a detector. You need to stop that run. You know, you need to notify us. You need to stop that run. Hey, my rate's been drifting. Oh, well, Let's send a message to the beam control and say my rate's been drifting. I need you to boost the beam current up. Uh, things like that. So you can see where this starts to become a closed loop instead of just a free for all of multi systems not talking to each other. Um, Python, I'm going to take a break here. I wish I had some water. But uh, and I, I joke, we're, we're in the home stretch, but um, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about Python, really. It's just there because I like the picture, but that's me. Um, so Plotly Kibana, again, um, I'm still working on kind of the idea or the, uh, the architecture of what we want this front end system to look like. It'd be nice to be able to control your data acquisition, it'd be nice to be able to visualize, it'd be nice to be able to do a lot of things. Um, what does that look like? Um, I'm still working with my, uh, with the users. Um, I've got uh, colleagues working with their users to do that. Um, so what's nice is that you can then start using some of these kind of off the shelf reporting tools as well, like uh, MicroStrategy, um, Tableau, um, Power BI, those types of things um, that give you some really nice reporting um, that you can uh, you can pull in, and maybe Kibana doesn't give you some of those same uh, 
uh, flexibility. That's what like MicroStrategy or some of these other tools do. Um, I like Plotly because I think it'd be really cool. Um, I have run experiments from my phone before. Um, we do it all command line uh, driven interfaces for the data acquisition. So you have to SSH into the box and then I've got a you know, squint a terminal <laughs> on my phone, which isn't very fun, but it helps when the students call you in the middle of the night and say stuff broke. Like, okay. You're all going to look. Um, and I actually, old apartment here in Knoxville, I run an experiment in CERN, which is kind of fun. You know, you sit there and <laughs> stop running an experiment in CERN. So um, the other advantage here of, of using Plotly is um, that you can start using Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, big thing in physics is uh, log books. Um, you know, you got to keep track of what you're doing, right? I mean, science is, um, you know, know that. That's one of the things that's irking me about some of the data science that I, I run into these days is that it's like, well, did you, you know, record anything about your model there, your machine model? Oh, no, I just found the one that works. It's like, well, wh which one worked? Why did it work? Ah, that. What did the other one look like? Maybe that was actually better. Um, you know, joking aside, I, I think Plotless is great um, in terms of being able to give you the interactive plots. Um, you know, being able to house this stuff in Jupyter Notebooks is going to be a, a huge advantage over what we traditionally do, which is I write it down on a piece of paper, and then if I need to uh, take a picture of my plot, I print it out, and I cut it, and I get glue, and I glue it in, and, you know, and then I draw a little smiley face next to it, and that goes for my uh, DSP development, too. So. Um, this is something I'm rather proud of. This was uh, a prototype uh, ray monitor from... Uh, built in Kibana um, from an actual real experiment ran uh, during April 12th. Um, so you can see on the left um, kind of uh, a dial, you know, here's the events per second kind of live. Um, you know, here it is graphed as a box this way or that way, um, you know, hey, race my class, that kind of stuff. So this is uh, rather exciting to me that um, I, I've worked with a, um, actually maybe the next slide. Yeah, so this is something I, I put together real quick for my, uh, my plotly visualization. I was uh, wanting to learn how to use Flask and uh, WTF forms. So I sat down uh, one evening and in about an hour I put together this guy. So you put in your um, kit display and energy histogram and pulls this out of the Postgres database, um, which I can think we all agree is going to be much nicer than pulling it out of a root tree. Um, <laughs> so it was just a, a little uh, toy project that I worked on just to kind of get myself familiar with the Flask framework, um, you know, and that kind of stuff. And whether or not but uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a really nice proof of concept of kind of what we can do. Uh, obviously, the plot, the plot needs some work, but um, I think overall it's a nice, um, nice visualization. Uh, that brings me to the actual project at hand, and here, at hand, and here's my shameless plug. Uh, so the, the new project that I'm working on to counter enumerating um, is a streaming uh, data acquisition analysis framework called it Dolose. Um, my primary um, a collaboration group is at um, Itempa Labs in South Africa. Um, and uh, I worked with them on the previous incarnation of this. And um, so as I started working in the industry as a legit data scientist, I realized these parallels and put this together. Um, we've got collaborate. This is part of my uh, mutual collaboration agreement that I always have to include their, uh, their logo. Um, and so we're also working with the University of Stellenbosch, University of Western Cape. Um, I helped these guys get some of the very first data out of their, um, uh, their new detector lab. Um, so that was exciting getting to work with those guys on some data uh, analytics projects. Um, then we've got a guy at Vanderbilt University and I'm um, on the project right now. Um, so basically, you just aggregate everything we just talked about in terms of, uh, you know, Plotly and, and Python. Kafka, and, and you've got this guy here. Um, right now, we're still in some of the initial planning phases. I've got some actual code out. Um, I've got stuff, uh, producers, consumers, that kind of thing. I have those right now. Um, but uh, yeah, we are actively um, uh, recruiting for this. It's a fun project. Um, it's a chance for you know people to get their hands dirty, turn on a few papers, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so we are actually writing the paper for this. Um, but uh, so yeah, this is just a project status. I kind of went over this. Um, obviously, one of the big things, the reason I was in, uh, looking into Flask is the hardware interfaces um, are very important. The, the modules are no good if you can't configure them, right? Um, and so we're, we're working on that. Um, building out the backlog is a task in here that we need to build out um, some more of the non hardware centric tasks like the database management, you know, investigates parquet files, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, my house has been in a constant state of disrepair for the past couple of months, so I had time to deal with some of it. I don't have a lot to say on these because they're just brain children of mine, shall we say. Um, so uh, one of the things that we can do is this um, particle identification. So some detectors 
wave come in and interact, it looks different than a neutron. That's what you see down here. So this peak here are the gamma rays that enter the detector. This peak here are the neutrons that enter this detector. Um, and you can see they bleed together just a little bit. Um, one of the things I think would be really cool to do is, um, is get some machine learning algorithms trained up. Here's what a signal from this guy looks like. Here's what a signal from this guy looks like. Tell me the difference, right? Because those algorithms can typically tell you much better than the traditional methods can um, in terms of um, the differentiation between these two. Um, the, this is a sample trace. This is a, from a barium chloride detector. Um, and so you can see uh, traditional methods to do this discrimination is you take the uh, direction of the signal um, and you just take a ratio. Right. I'm pretty sure I can train a machine learning algorithm to recognize the difference between two different signals <laughs> a lot better than just taking a straight ratio of the two um, components. Uh, so we've got a simply trace, as you can see, it's got a lot of different components, it does look like the previous ones we saw. Um, so doing the anomaly detection will certainly help out with some of the uh, assumptions that we make with our fitting. Is this actually the right signal to apply this shape to? Um, and I will leave the summary up and close there because you can all read. That's it. No, we're done. I was actually serious. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Have you checked out Plotly Dash? Not yet. It's it's on my list of things to do. I just use just straight very briefly. Um, so I'm still looking at some of the. There's some new ones on the market as well. Not, there's a. Maybe just Plotly Dash or Plotly Express or something. So like yeah, so a couple more things I've done one recently. So. Yeah. Probably Express is something the one I'm thinking quick of. Quick plots. Yep. Um, yeah, so probably Dash for those don't know. Probably Dash is basically built on class. Oh, okay. And cool. Incorporates Plotly functions into it. So essentially, 50, 50 lines of code, you can basically visualize it on one of the nice. classes. They also have, I don't know if you know this, uh, Dash Deck. So Interesting. They're, they're doing, essentially, they're building uh, like LabVIEW style. Yeah. Like, like, Knobs and mm -hmm. cursor. So it's built on Dash. Perfect. So that might give it a chance to take a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. That'll certainly make our job a little bit easier to yeah, you know, set up some of these. All MIT. Yeah, so MIT should. Uh, yeah, MIT's permissive license, so it should, shouldn't yeah. be conflict there. So cool. thanks. So you know the the is just too much data to analyze. Yes. Would your system be able no. to <laughs> <laughs> um, not at those typically. Um, those types of data rates will overwhelm a system like this, I'm pretty sure. Uh, um, you would probably have to use, I think you could do it, but you would have to have multiple. So this box here, this is called the copper broker. It's basically the, the brains behind gets get the right messages. I think in order to handle those types of data rates, simply because uh, Kafka's throughput's not going to be high enough, you would have to have uh, multiple sets of Kafka um, in a reasonable way. Um, and this is just off the cuff, so I could be completely wrong. Uh, but yeah, I think that would be probably the, uh, the way to handle uh, data loads like that. Um, like I said, the White Rabbit uh, system was, was produced out of CERN to deal with like, precision across 15 kilometers, but you know, they managed to do it. Um, I think you would have to really scale the system up and, uh, in order to do that. And honestly, I, I don't think Kafka would be the tool for the job. I think we're going to need a new protocol um, in order to handle something like that. So when you see the real world loads, you know, like let's say you have a, a crash experiment, you're trying to take a you could use it for a uh, um, experiment like that. Should, you're looking at data rates similar to what I have here, right? You're about 600 counts per second uh, across your detector arrays. Tip, my thesis experiment had 146 channels. Um, most of them were counting at this type of rate. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you, 140 channels. yeah, counting at 600 counts per second. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this kind of system will work fairly well for those um, because you have to reduce the overall load that goes to the coffee itself. That's something I didn't talk about on the hardware itself, but you can do uh, coincidences on the hardware itself, um, you know, to reduce that data rate. Um, so I had some of my detectors were counting in the uh, millions of counts per second, but we were able to take an advantage to be able to cut those data down to one or two counts per second in those situations. So um, I, I think you, you just need to be smart about how you do here or what here. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to go away, to be honest, um, because 
Yes, you want as much of the raw data as possible, but you know, as much as we hate, it, storage is cheap these days, but it's not that cheap. And, and really, one of the things you could do um, in this model here is you could have your producer, instead of producing into a Kafka topic here, instead produce to a, um, you know, a parquet file or some kind of traditional binary data file, and then you could have something offline reading back into your Kafka queue as well. Um, so that's a way to kind of sidestep the, the rate limitations that you have in Kafka um, that you're talking about. Um, it's not my preferred scenario because then you kind of run back into what I talked about at the beginning, right? You, know, you still have to decode and pack those data. But in principle, you only do that and then it deals with some of this stuff. And I think you're never going to get away from having these guys because you always need the online analysis and you always need the live rate monitoring. Um, you can down sample some of this to get these uh, fairly easily as well. But um, I, I just don't think this is not going to scale to LHC levels. Thank you. I'm going to end. I will just.